Hi, everybody. Welcome to Big Impacts for Small Towns, Strategy for Capital Investments in Rural Projects. I am Jenna Lopachinsky. I'm a field service rep for the Preservation Trust of Vermont, and I'll be moderating the session and just want to do a little bit of housekeeping before we jump into today's conversation. We are recording the session and we'll make it available on YouTube in the next few days. We'll be sending a follow-up email, hopefully by the end of the week, and the link will be included in that information. Um, just a reminder to please keep your mics muted unless you're speaking. And I recommend um, that you change your Zoom to speaker view so you'll see the full screen of the panelists as they're talking. To do that, there's a view in the top right-hand corner of your Zoom screen and you can move from gallery to speaker. We'll have a few minutes at the end of the session for questions and please use either the raise hand function from the bottom of your screen or type questions into the chat box and we'll have a staff person from one of the statewides keeping an eye on that throughout the session. There may be more questions than we have time for answers because we are going to try and stick to our, our 60 minute time slot, um, but we will do our best to get follow up responses and share them with the attendees. Um, but the, the goal for today's discussion is to learn about successful strategies for rural historic preservation and community development projects and to really dive into the question of how. How do you build a successful team and project? How do you find and manage funding sources? And we're joined by four panelists representing four of our Northeast Heritage Economy Program projects, all of which received 2019 subgrants from the Northern Border Regional Commission's Regional Forest Economy Partnership Program. And I'll turn it over to the panelists to introduce themselves and their projects. We're joined by Patrick Myers of Senator Theater in Dover Foxcroft, Maine, Laurel Will, representing the Parker J. Noyes Block in Lancaster, New Hampshire, Isaac Wagner of Wagner Development Partners for the Bridgewater Community Center in Bridgewater, Vermont, and Andy Buchanan representing Whitcomb's Garage in Wallensburg, Waylandsburg, New York. My apologies for that. So I'll give you each a few minutes to introduce yourselves and your projects, and we'll start with you, Patrick. Thanks so much. I really enjoy being here. Um, yeah, my name is Patrick Myers. I'm the executive director at the Center Theater in Dover Foxcroft. We're a performing arts venue, movie theater, also host of the main Whoopie Pie Festival, if you've ever been up in Dover for that. If you haven't, uh, June 24th, 2023. Uh, our project, uh, we've always been had, we've always had one theater, our large auditorium that seats 260 odd people. Um, and we decided that what would really work for us would be to have a smaller second screen where we could do smaller events, use for rentals, things like that. Um, and that's what our project was. Little did we know as we were planning the project that, uh, oh, there we are, there we were. Uh, so that's the outside of the theater, what the uh, space looked like. And then once the coffee shop moved out, the new theater there on the far right. Um, of course, we never knew that COVID was going to hit and make this one of the most, oh, I don't know, complicated renovation projects we've ever undergone. But uh, the NHEP was certainly a huge part of making it a success, and I'm, we're really grateful. Great. And Laurel? Hi, I'm Laurel Will at the Northern Forest Center. I'm the Director of Finance here. And um, we do lots of different things here at the center, but one thing, uh, one activity we, we began a few years ago is buying and redeveloping properties to increase the um, availability of, of, of sort of reasonably priced housing for, um, for middle income professionals. This is, I, I'm trying not to use the words affordable and low income because that's not really what we're trying to do here. That, that um, segment is pretty well served by a lot of other uh, programs. Um, what we did here in Lancaster is uh, back in October of 2018, purchased an 11,000 square foot historic building, which um, was really in, in pretty sad shape and had basically had no, no existing activity in it. Um, we did a full rehab of the building um, and received a number of funds to do some historic work. We tried to replicate the original, um, the window layout, um, that sign that you can see is an original, um, or a, rep a replication of an original sign. But basically we, we created a building here where the first floor tenant is a retail um, operation, Taproot, she's a, she's a uh, 
kind of a local, a local business person who does a number of different things, including at this having a food marketplace called the Root Cellar, and she's greatly expanding her her space by moving mm -hmm. into our first floor. On the second and third floors, we have a total of six two bedroom apartments. Um, and again, as I said, we we purchased the building back in 2018. We too began work. Um, right at the beginning of COVID in the spring of 2020. We've recently pretty much completed construction. There's a few minor things still going on on the first floor. Our second and third floor tenants have just moved in this um, the end of the summer. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there as that, that's my introduction. I'm, I'm sure we'll get to talk more about it later. That top picture is a picture of one of the apartments. Thanks, Laurel. And Isaac? There we go. Got the mute button. <laughs> um, hi, thanks for having me. Um, um, my name is uh, Isaac Wagner, yes. and um, I'm representing um, uh, the Bridgewater Community Foundation, which um, um, is trying to turn this building that you see in the picture um, into a community center housing, um, uh, a child care center, senior services, uh, other community uh, outposting services and a um, uh, ultimately an emergency shelter for the town. Um, this uh, Bridgewater is uh, the town of Bridgewater in Vermont is located uh, between uh, Woodstock, Vermont, if you're familiar with Vermont, between Woodstock, Vermont and Killington. It's on Route 4. Um, it is the home of Long Trail Ale. Uh, that's uh, that's its, uh, its main brewery location. Um, and, um, but it's, 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 um, it's a town that is often passed pretty quick on your way to Killington or your way to Woodstock. Uh, so it has a, a small little village area and um, this schoolhouse is, uh, is right there. And um, in 2015, the schoolhouse uh, became a uh, victim of uh, school consolidation as, as we see throughout the Northeast quite often. And the community went through a process to figure out what to do with it, um, and including, uh, which actually was the, the the goal at one point was to demolish it. And a group of citizens got together and um, um, you know tried to save it, or, 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 or ha has saved it effectively. Um, the picture you're looking at here is the is the front facade of the building that faces Route Four, um, and that was built in 1914. Uh, there's a uh, subsequent 1948 edition, and then even further back, a 1991 edition. And to date, we've finished the renovation in the 1991 portion. We have uh, child care centers now open there. And um, due to the ongoing effects of on construction, uh, effects of the pan pandemic on construction costs, uh, uh, we're <laughs> using every means possible to try, try to get the rest of it going. A quick note on the NHEP program. They were one of our first funders in the door, the first one to take a chance on this project. And um, they precipitated a lot of additional state and federal funding uh, on this, as well as private funding on this project. So in that sense, uh, the the funds were a real catalyst. And um, one, um, one final note is, I'm a little bit different than some of the other speakers here. I'm not the executive director, I'm not a volunteer. Uh, I'm actually a paid consultant, and I've been working with the Bridgewater Group now for almost four years, and so I have a slightly different perspective, I think, than uh, some of the others in terms of uh, building capacity here. So uh, hopefully we can get to some of that in the Q&A period. Thank you. Absolutely. Great. Thanks, Isaac. And Andy. Okay, hi. Well, uh, good to be here. Um, my name's Andy Buchanan. I'm the uh, Vice President of the Wellensburg Grange Hall Association. Um, and our project um, was the restoration of Whitcomb's Garage, as you can see the building you see here, um, which is uh, in the center of the very small hamlet of, uh, of Wellensburg, just outside of Essex, uh, Essex, New York. Um, so I think, as you can see from the top image there, um, this is a building without any particular uh, architectural merit whatsoever. Um, it was uh, essentially a vernacular 
building put together over many years, beginning in the the earliest part, probably in the nineteen in the nineteen twenties. It had been added to over the years over over the years since. Um, but uh, it's uh, a really iconic building at the centre of the community. Um, and it had been it, uh, it had ceased operating as a gas station in the, in the late 1990s and had basically been in decline since then. And um, you know, in many ways, was kind of symbolic of of, of, of sort of broader rural rural decline. Um, when a, when a building that everybody drives by um, several times a day uh, starts to uh, starts to go starts to collapse in that fashion. Um, so our, the project um, that was undertaken by the Waylandsburg Grange Hall, the, Waylands, the Grange is a non-profit uh, community arts organization. Uh, we, uh, our main building is just across the street from, from, Whitcomb's, from Whitcomb's Garage, um, where we host movies and lectures, music shows, and, 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 and so on. So from the beginning, our project to, 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 uh, to bring, to, re to restore this building was, was, was connected with a, a goal of, uh, of economic uh, revival um, and the building now hosts uh, a blacksmith, uh, a woodworking shop, uh, pottery studio, a uh, small craft store and, uh, and, and, a, community, and a community space. Um, so all of those aspects taking place, all of those different things taking place inside the building, which also, also has a, an acre and a half of riverfront green space behind it, which we're now, which we're now working on, uh, on, on, on developing uh, that in, vari in, vari in various ways. I'll say a little bit more in the, uh, when we get on to the questions on some of the aspects of the mobilization of volunteer, uh, volunteer labor for this, this project. I, I will just to say here, the whole project was, was accomplished with volunteer, with volunteer labor. Um, and uh, and the, the 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 budget for the entire thing uh, is was was well in the region of 120 130 thousand not not including the building itself which was which was gifted which, which was which was gifted to us um the NHEP uh, grant played an important received played an important part in that but it was really a, a number of smaller a smaller grants to, to to put all to put all of that together anyway um the building was recognized the, the project was recognized by the new york uh, preservation league of new york in 2021 we won we won one of their excellence in preservation awards which um was really fantastic and um, I think uh, also indicative of the, the sort of broader thinking in the historic preservation community of, of, around the questions of adaptive, adaptive reuse of buildings that are not necessarily architectural gems in and of their own, in, in and of themselves, but have broader uh, community, community meaning and impact. So anyway, I think that's probably enough by way of introduction. We can come back to some of the, some of the uh, other aspects of this in the, in, in the questions. Great. Thank you so much, Andy, and everyone for the introductions and the setting the stage for the discussion. Um, so we've got about a half hour of the panel, and then we'll have time for a Q&A after that. So we'll dive into some of the basics and build from there. Um, so, you know, starting at the, the very beginning, who did you need to help pull these projects off? And how did you find that expertise? Um, Laurel? Let's start with you. Yeah, so um, definitely a big team was needed and that includes people that we went out and found outside of our own organization. But I do want to first acknowledge that it did require some pretty significant um, oversight from our uh, internal paid staff. And we did not utilize volunteers in the way some of the other projects did, but we had um, between myself and uh, one of our field staff kind of, um, I'm not gonna say we were 100% devoted to this project, but it was a very significant piece of our work for a couple of years. Um, we hired an architect, um, we used Stuart Anderson of Alba Architects in um, kind of all the way through the process from the beginning and the design into some construction oversight. We were able to hire a, um, a construction management firm, Garland Mill, who was local to the area. And we really felt like having local connections and building local support was a huge part of the project's success. Um, we had uh, very supportive town government uh, members. So from the town manager to other people in that, in that team, that became hugely critical as we, um, you know, we, they, they, paved a sidewalk for us and we had to do some uh, sewer repair and just having that, 
that partnership with the town be so productive um, was just in, immeasurable. We had a couple of local business people that were also hugely supportive. Um, a lot of behind the scenes work to sort of just build, build um, support for the project and help us find our way in the community. Um, and then of course we also hired, uh, we had our owner's rep for part of the, part of the process. He continued on with the project as, a, um, as part of the, the project management team. Um, and then we also used a historical consultant in the early stages. Um, we, we never did uh, end up getting listed or going for listing on the National Historic Register, but she provided huge amount of guidance in securing some important funding for the project and also helping us sort of identify the standards that we wanted to meet. Um, we are on, on the state register. Um, so that's kind of a, like I said, it's sort of a web of support. Um, we then expanded with funders, but I think I thought I'd just stick with the sort of the, the team that that got the project off the ground first. No, oh, that's perfect. Um, Isaac, why don't you talk a little bit about um, pulling together the team for Bridgewater, knowing that you are a, a important part of that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll start a little bit with the the history of how I became introduced to the project in the first place. Um, it was, a, it was a very, very, it's, a, it's an ingredient number one in my book, a very, very committed local group of people that passionately felt that the building should be saved and it could be turned into a community asset. Um, it's got great bones. You've probably heard that term before. It's very, it's, it's, a, it's very, a relatively simple adaptive reuse to do and the uh, thought of demolishing it um, was really tough for them. And so they worked for several years and they made a lot of trips to a lot of phone calls, a lot of trips to Montpelier. Um, they did the rounds at various funding agencies. And, um, you know, they, it, it had a lot of other great ingredients. They had a town that was it, it willing to, to play, play along, at least, at least give lip service at the beginning. Um, like I said, it had a good group of people. They had some, uh, early funding commitments, but they pretty quickly began to get mired in um, cross-cutting uh, funder requirements. <laughs> and there, I think the reality of like, this is such a great project, we'll get a bunch of grant money um, and actually applying and managing that grant money um, hit, them, hit them pretty hard. And, um, at, you know, for a volunteer, an all volunteer organization. So I was introduced to it. I got, a, I was asked by the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And if you're not from Vermont, they're a quasi state agency uh, that does a lot of great things in housing and conservation. But I was introduced to this project by the Vermont Housing and Conservation and, and asked to go up there and just sit down with them. And, um, and I did that. And um, we realized pretty quickly that they really needed a like a full scale feasibility study. They had environmental, they had historic, they had uh, ownership, but they had a bunch of different issues that they needed to blend in together and do a full feasibility study. So our actual first funder in on this project was the Vermont Community Development Program and they awarded the town of the project a planning grant. And it was with that planning grant that we were able to really jumpstart the project. Um, and, um, and as I mentioned before, uh, the NHEP grant funding was brand new, just came out, came out right at the exact time we were finishing up our planning grant feasibility study. And that's what sort of launched, you know, launched the project there. So, so that was a long winded way of saying, I think our expertise was found with a lot of help from our funding agencies in Vermont, uh, the Community Development Program, Housing Conservation Board, Preservation Trust of Vermont, and others, they really assisted us uh, in the early stages and continue to continue to now. Great, perfect, thanks Isaac. Um, and Andy, you had alluded to the fact that the Waylandsburg Garage Project was um, led by a lot of volunteers. How did you put all of those talents together and, and fill gaps when you needed to? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the 
project was ma was overseen by the board of the Wellensburg Grange Hall Association. So, um, I mean, that was the body that had responsibility for it. Um, but it didn't really deal with the day-to-day -day planning organization aspects of, uh, of, of this. Um, and uh, we only have one part-time worker. So although she was able to help with the with some of the grant administration questions, um, this was not a this was that we did we don't have the staff to 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 administer a project like this. So basically um what we what we did was essentially to begin by organizing a couple of, of volunteer work days to actually just clear up to clear the the building which was in a ter terrible mess of all kinds of stuff inside it and stuff um and um the, we do have a base of volunteer supporters of the grange who help or who help run all kinds of projects in it, within the building um so there was an initial group of people there and and of course we 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 advertised it widely we encouraged all kinds of other people to come to come and participate um and um i don't know i don't think you can really we couldn't I, I i as the person asked by the board to to organize this i i could not have said beforehand where exactly these people would come from um but they when we needed them they were there um we had a couple of people in particular one of whom's a very very experienced contractor um and another guy who had been uh, a local code a local co building code officer and basically the two of them joined me on a small committee which which actually organized the the work um and their expert i mean it couldn't have been done without their expertise and oversight basically um and they they were able to navigate through all the the relevant code issues and and i mean we did not have an architect we had some we had a couple of ar architects volunteered some time um to 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 to, to do some some basic some basic renderings which were used for fundraising but we really didn't have um you know a sophisticated plan in that we had a lot of we had a lot of people with some expertise and 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 willingness to get in and figure it figure it out it's a very it's a very simple it's a very simple building um i'm going to say um contrary to most people's experience i think that, that covid was a huge asset for us um, in a bizarre sort of a way, um, because what ha what happened, of course, during COVID was that, that none of the activities that normally take place within the Grange were happening. So the music shows, the cinema, the the, the discussion forums of various kinds. Um, so we had a lot of people who really who who to, for whom volunteering at the Grange is a big part of their lives, um, who um, actually couldn't do that in the way that they would normally do it. And um, because the building was basically open to the elements, um, it was a relatively safe oh, environment for um, people to actually come and, um, and volunteer their awesome. time and participate in the construction effort. So um, it act, in, a, in a certain sense, um, the, the Whitcombs project kind of, kind of sustained our the, the, the enthusiasm and engagement of our, of our volunteers through this, through this period. Um, just uh, just finally on the funding on on the uh, so so basically what happened is we 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 all, the, the the heart of the project was basically monthly um a monthly work days um which um i mean we could talk about in more detail like we don't really have time necessarily here but 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 figuring out how you organize volunteers so that every single person who comes um whatever their level of experience um however many hours they can or can't contribute comes in and is plugged into something and and goes away feeling that they've made a real contribution um and the whole thing's well organized there's you know there's food available there's some beer afterwards there's you know there's a social aspect to how you to how you how you organize a volunteer project uh, in ways that that people really feel that they make which they are they feel they're making a contribution and uh, and just an observation on as the thing got going i mean literally people would stop by you know driving by would stop and you know would start you know i bought my first car here in 1948 or you know whatever the story you know i came in here, here as a little kid and there used to be a jar of cookies on the table here you know i mean whatever the story was you the the project sort of tapped in because of that aspect of of revival of an of what had been an iconic building it, it tapped into an awful lot of of memories and and consequently of enthusiasm for seeing the for seeing the for seeing the building come back to life so 
anyway, there's a few ideas on how how we how we were able to do it here. Yeah, absolutely, and and a nice representation of all kind of the broad spectrum of uh, approaches to to building capacity and um, getting the community involved. Um, so. What advice do you all have for groups about, you know, creating the case for their project and what really seems to resonate? And Patrick, if you want to chime in on that. Thanks, Jenna. Yeah, I'm, for me, um, <clears throat> I guess a little background, Dover Foxcroft is a pretty rural area. Um, we are the county seat of our county, but the whole county only has about 17,000 people in it. And that's in a county the size of Connecticut. So it's pretty sparse. And so whether we're creating a case for, you know, a federal grant or local funders, I always think it's about telling a story. So if you're new to this process, you know, before you worry about budgets and all that, worry about, I would say, worry about your story. Uh, and you'll hear people talk about elevator speeches or you'll watch Shark Tank and you'll see them in front of a panel. But for me, it's a much more personal process, um, talking about people and how your organization makes the community better, and then making sure your project is part of that overall story. Uh, you know, at, here at the Center Theater, you know, if I walk into a room and, you know, tell a funder I want to build a movie theater, a little 40-seat movie theater, that may not be such a great story to tell. Um, but if we start talking about you know, bringing new opportunities for the arts, for entertainment into our rural community. Um, and then, you know, layering COVID on top of that, giving us extra space so we could rent the theater out to a family who might be immunocompromised and really wants to celebrate their kid's birthday by watching a movie in a movie theater. Um, you know, those are the stories that funders really latch on to. And it makes for a compelling case. Um, and then when you have great supporters like the NHEP and you can use that to leverage other funds along the way, you start getting into a great spiral, a great snowball, and it becomes a cause and not just a project. So that's kind of where I go with that. Yeah, that's great. Um, and Andy, you had touched on a little of this in the in your opening remarks and then as well in your um, the first question you answered. Did you all feel like you needed to tell a story with this project or did the location of the building kind of sell itself? Well, it does sell itself, but the story still needs to be told. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I think that both the, both uh, um, Isaac and Patrick's comments on this about about the place of these buildings that have that have that have some sort of iconic resonance that people do not want to see them. They don't necessarily know what they want to do with them, what happens to them, but they don't want to see them go away. Um, that have that have some symbolic importance, and that and 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 once you and, and those buildings are literally all over all over rural America. Um, so there's a you know, I think that the stories that it can then become attached to them. Um, I mean, the huge question for us along those lines was, and this was true for the Grange project as well, was 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 really thinking about and and and, and being very consciously thinking about. Um, the relationship between between people who've arrived in this community in the last several years and people who grew, who grew up here, which which can be a huge divide um, in many in, in many in many places, and and so that and so trying to find the ways of 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 presenting this and and, and not just presenting it, it really being something that 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 was seen by the whole community as as an as an asset and not just this is this is something that incomers are doing or so you know it's those kinds those kinds of those kinds of ideas so so for us those those stories that i was just recounting of people stopping and giving their experiences and all of that kind of stuff um those are those are solid gold in this kind of project because those those are representations of people's attachment to, to to the building and to and and through that to what's to what's happening with its you know with it with, with its with its revival um, and what that means for their for their sense of community more broadly for their morale and so on and so forth. i mean all of these are and they're very intangible things but when you have them you really know you have them i i, I think so i don't know if that th completely answers the, the question but 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 i think those figuring out how how the story how the story grows out of that um is is really critical i think 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about um, funding stacks. So tips and thoughts about assembling and managing challenging funding stacks and budgets. Um, Laurel, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, so we had raised, we had, we had done a project in Millinocka where we developed a million dollar fund, um, which was of impact investments, which really were just uh, unsecured loans at low interest rates. So we had some people who really meant meant it when they said they wanted to make an impact investment. They weren't looking for big returns. They wanted their dollars to go to work somewhere. Um, in Millinocket, we utilized it to purchase six buildings, six residential buildings, and, and create 11 units of rental space. Um, so we kind of turned around and decided we wanted to replicate that. We thought we'd raise another million dollars in Lancaster, New Hampshire, to do, um, to do some kind of a project. That project became the Parker J. Noyes building. Um, and that project turned into be a $3.5 million project. So obviously our investment fund wasn't going to be enough, um, but it was a key part of it. it. It allowed us to get going because that those funds were, were already in hand um, and were available for us to use at extremely low interest rates. Um, so we went out to raise a lot of money from a lot of different places. Um, for example, NHEP, that was a, a, an important grant that we received. We received a few additional grants from some state foundations to do historic preservation. Um, we also received grant money from um, you know, smaller chunks of grant money to do different pieces of the project. Uh, a super important part that we didn't realize we were going to utilize was new market tax credit financing, um, which is pretty complicated to go after. We had some good partners. Um, we had some local in-house experience um, to help us navigate that process. We had helped other organizations utilize NMTC financing. Um, so we had sort of, we had experience from a different, uh, different vantage point, um, but that was a big learning curve for, my, for us. Um, and it required a tremendous amount of due diligence on the financial side and, um, Kind of vetting of all of the various construction partners that were working with the project. It, it was a big lift in the end. I think it was uh, valuable for many reasons. We really dug into some of our costs and partners and, and, and were required to have a lot of money gathered up front, which I think really helped see the project through to the end instead of um, getting derailed by what I, everyone I think experienced some pretty significant price escalation because of COVID. Um, we received individual gifts. We did a crowdsource funding um, campaign where we received support from lots of different places, but specifically community members. So we really kind of put together funding from lots of different places. I did a quick little breakdown. I think about 40% of the project was funded by our own investment fund and a clean energy loan that we got from CDFA. Another 22% or so was from NMTC financing and also uh, New Hampshire tax credits. Um, another 18% or so from grants and another 20% from individual gifts. So pretty complicated financial stack. Um, and I know we're gonna get into this later, but a lot of um, grant reporting requirements that, that intersect with each other. Um, so trying to keep all of that straight, uh, I think that's kind of why we needed the in-house dedicated staff um, support for all of that as well. Absolutely. And, and that kind of um, ties in perfectly with, with Patrick's um, thoughts. Patrick, do you want to talk a little bit about overlapping eligibilities within the grant programs? Yeah, thanks, Jenna. And that's, <clears throat> for me, that's kind of a new term. Uh, I would previously colloquially call it, you know, duplicating funding sources, but that sounds like you're double dipping, which you never want to do. So Isaac taught me this great new term, overlapping eligibilities. And it's just talks about being having some flexibility in your funding stack. Um, you know, we all know when we get grants or get support from different programs, a lot of them come with different requirements. They can only be spent for equipment or for construction expenses, or, you know, they can't have be spent on certain things. Um, so trying as best you can as you're developing your funding to have some of those sources overlapping to give you the flexibility you need if different parts of the budget, shockingly, uh, don't come in quite as you expected. Um, 
and like Laurel was saying, uh, you know, crowdsourcing and getting those individual and business donations, which, at least in my experience, typically don't come with so many strings attached. Um, it just gives you a lot more stability when the unexpected happens. And, and I think going along with that is knowing intentionally how you're going to be spending the money out of that stack. Um, you know, obviously some funders want to come in last and you have to respect that. But, you know, if you do have funding that is strictly for one aspect of the project and you have another pile that's unrestricted, you know, spend all that restricted money right out of the gate if you can and save that unrestricted flexible money towards later when you're likely to run into those little pinch points that can keep you up at night. Thanks, Patrick. And Isaac, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of the post grant agreement and the management of the grants and handling the drawdowns? Yes, um, uh, and I'll just, <laughs> this could be a, a whole nother session unto itself. So I'll try to keep it uh, kind of tight. Um, it, it, if you've got two or three or four or more funding sources in the project, particularly if they're federally derived funds or they're a tax credit, uh, you're just gonna have um, uh, layers of requirements to have to navigate. So, you know, just my experience working with volunteers is, you know, there's a feeling of, yeah, we reached the finish line when we were awarded the grant. And, 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 the, and it's easy to think that way. Cause like, yeah, we got the grant, but, but <laughs> reality is you're just getting started and it, it can get pretty complicated to, to the point, to the point that sometimes you're, you're granting your funding partners sometimes almost feel like adversaries uh, because they're throwing at you the requirements most of the time are passed through requirements on their behalf. You know, they have to do these things to satisfy some law or requirement or rule. And um, it, can, it can get contentious if you're not organized about it. Um, and I could go on and on about that, but I, I will say the one thing that I keep on running across over and over again, particularly lately, is a lot of the grants that are provided, including NHEP, I believe, um, were, are reimbursable grants. And, and that's, that's easy you know when you're applying for a grant to be like okay fine great just give us the grant and you know on the granting agency just make sure everybody understands this is a reimbursable grant you know you have to spend the money to to do the project and um you know i run into uh, organizations that end up in a cash flow pinch because they can't when to if you do the math on it they can't actually float months and months of construction costs for instance or even pre-development costs um, on a reimbursable basis. So, you know, that, that has tripped up. And, and not only that, it, getting a bank to lend it to you is not always the easiest thing, depending on your project either. So um, it, it kind of speaks a little bit to what Patrick was saying. You know, sometimes if you have flexible money, you can use that as sort of bridge funding. Um, but I, I would say in, in terms of a... Um, uh, a sound bite or a short thing to keep your eye out if you're just starting a development project. Keep your eye on what you think that cash flow is going to be and make sure you don't run out. Uh, you'll get the grants eventually, but you have to be able to bridge that period between when contractors need to be paid and when you're eligible to actually draw down on your grants. And, and building off of that kind of thinking in the realm of fundraising, you know, how do you how do you fundraise for these kind of middle ground projects that you you can't support them with um, bake sales alone, but you also may not have the capacity to hire a professional fundraiser? I think you work a lot in that middle area. Do you have any any recommendations or any words of caution on that? Oh, I, I, um, well, just to, to expand on your the answer is no. Um, to, <laughs> to expand on your point, though. Um, it, it, you know, it's tricky uh, and somebody on this call or one of our presenters may have a, a better rule of thumb, but there's a certain place, a certain number that your project needs to kind of be at to warrant the investment into a capital campaign manager or a capital campaign firm. And I don't know if that's 5 million, 6 million, 7 million, somewhere in there. 
where that becomes much more realistic. It also depends on the composition and the location of your community. Um, so a lot of the projects I am, I work on fall under that. And so, you know, we, if you do a capital campaign, and, you know, typically that money is pledged or oftentimes given to you out front, and, you know, it, it helps you to have cash on hand to be able to bridge, you know, some of the federal grants that you or state grants that you do get. But in the absence of having that, that just makes it just sort of deepens your challenge. Like, you know, uh, how do we get that flexible source of cash um, to make interim payments until we can draw? In Vermont, we have a tax credit program called the Downtown and Village Tax Credit Program. And that's a neat, simple, it's a simple tax credit, not to be confused with the one Laurel was talking about, uh, which is which is much more uh, uh, the new markets and the uh, uh, reinvestment tax credits are a little bit more complicated. The downtown and village tax credit, however, you've got to not only have the project completely done, you've got to have your certificate of occupancy in hand and you've got to go to back to a bank or an investor um, to actually claim that. So not only is there a lag time, it's, you know, the project basically has to be complete before you can get your money from, from them. So that's just one example of, um, you know, uh, funding sources, easy to apply for, easy to get, easy to use, but you've got to bridge it. You've got to bridge that period of time and it can, becomes hard. Thanks, Isaac. And Patrick, would you like to speak a little bit about um, kind of fundraising in, in kind of the small rural community and, and tying back into the building connections that you had talked about earlier? Yeah, thanks. Um, it really is all about, especially I feel on this small scale in a rural community, it's about not just not building, building the connections with the donors, but making sure they feel a sense of ownership in the project. Um, especially true, we don't have a huge seasonal shift in our population, but there's a fairly sizable chunk of folks who come up here in the summer. They're up at the lake. Um, I love it when we get a rainy summer because then they come down to the theater off the lake, but otherwise it's hard to get them involved. So being able to build that sense of ownership with your project is huge. Uh, for this project in particular, you know, we were... Um, folks could get seat plaques on the back of every seat in that little theater. Um, and we also now have a short thank you video that plays before every movie screening in that video. And we've promised to do it as long as there are movies showing in that theater uh, that thanks all the funders to the program from the largest to the smallest. And, you know, we've, we know people are seeing it, uh, you know, unfortunately, because they mentioned typos in their thank yous in the video, but you know, it does mean they're watching it and they're connected to it. And just building that ownership, um, it'll help your current project succeed, but maybe even more importantly, it's building your base for your next project as well. Thanks, Patrick. And so one last um, question for our panelists before we move to the, to the open Q&A. Um, what about your approach to your projects can be replicated or what would you do differently um, if you're starting over again? And the pandemic can't be the thing that you do differently because we don't have control over that. Um, Andy, why don't we start with you? Well, I, I, I don't think we would do anything particularly differently, I, 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 I have to say. Um, but I, that also doesn't mean that I think there's a that there's the sort of um, I don't know, and and an, a sort of re, re, instant replicability kind of formula that 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 if only you have it you could reproduce. I I I don't think that's the case. Um, I mean, for us having a having an experienced uh, board of that have managed a Grange project for many years. Um, that has standing in the community in various different ways. Um, you know, to have an organisation already in place that this could that this could grow out of, um, I think was 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 absolutely critical. Although in in advance we could not have predicted how that growth would take place, who would step forward, how that would all how how that would all. But 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 we had some confidence that if you do it, people will respond. 
Um, and I, I guess if there's a if there is a um, you know rec replicability um, aspect, it, it's to have confidence that 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 these projects projects of this kind you know do have resonance, do strike a chord, do elicit response, um, and uh, to figure out in each individual specific way and and at the various scales we've been talking about, um, you know what that uh, what what that would be and how to and how to access it. I, I think there's many different ways of of, of doing of doing it um, as we've been hearing as we've been hearing this morning. Thank you, Isaac. Yeah, I would I would I would echo what Andy says. I think you know having that confidence um, in your group to know that you know you've got something here, and just continue to remind yourselves of that. Like, look at what we've done. Look at how far we've come. Uh, look at what we're able to do. I, I guess my replication um, question is is much more nuts and bolts and nitpicky. With the Bridgewater project, we approached it like a commercial building project. So we, the idea was like, go out, do the due diligence and the planning, find the money, get all the money together, put it out to bid, bring all, you know, you know, bring the contractors, do all the project at once, close it out, just like you would any commercial project. And the stacks of funding that we have layered made, made that difficult, number one. Um, and I'm going to say it, the COVID pandemic made it difficult, number two. And number three, the different um, types of funding. So we have historic preservation funding, we have energy funding, we have community. There were the different requirements of the different types of funders on the project also made it difficult. So if I have one regret on the Bridgewater project is that we weren't cognizant at least I wasn't cognizant early on that this is not a normal commercial project. This project is going to take time and you're going to have to take time and just pick away at it. This piece and that piece and this piece and that piece. Turns out that's what we've ended up doing anyway. Um, not for lack of doing it the other way where we've ended up falling into this way where we're just picking away at it piece by piece. I think we could have saved a fair amount of time and hit heartache if um, we had started the project in that way um, rather than trying to take off trying trying to bite off more than we could chew in one go thanks laurel yeah so um a lot of what isaac just said absolutely resonates i think um we again because of our nmtc financing we're kind of required to approach it like a commercial project with lining up all the funding in advance um, and I think that um, one thing that's really important for replicating something like this is paying a lot of attention to those cash flow issues you have, especially if you're going to be relying on reimbursable grants. Um, one thing we utilized that I didn't mention was we had a, an extremely friendly and favorable bridge financer that came in and brought was able to give us a bridge loan, which we have fully re repaid now. Um, but on very favorable terms. So it's not a traditional bank bridge financing. So finding a partner like that um, was super helpful. So that's one thing that I think is, um, and, and it really helps you through those cash flow crunches because if you're, if, if you're relying on this kind of funding that comes in over time, it's very unlikely that your funding is gonna time well with your expenses. Um, and you don't want that to be the reason that you get stalled or delayed. Um, so that I think is something that's important for replicating is to have a pretty, make your best effort at a good cash flow uh, pro forma. Um, one thing that worked for us also is having sort of that something special. I think some of these other projects were clearly special, a theater, um, a community center, but ours was gonna be a, a, a building, a commercial building that we were gonna rent. Um, but having that first floor tenant involved, the food marketplace, someone who was already locally known um, and she basically brings together a number of farmers and, and acts almost like an indoor farmer's market, except it's year round, all kinds of different products. And she, she provides a lot of other services. That was a great um, kind of special part of our story. So finding something like that, that's special about your building that allows you to then kind of build on your fundraising. Um, and then the last thing that I think is sort of a key ingredient for replication is in our case, it was dedicated paid staff. I believe you can do this with volunteers, but you need an immense level of commitment um, of someone who's really accountable to the project to really see things through and 
you know, again, map together those, those different um, kind of requirements from your various funding sources. And then a warning to echo what Isaac said is, is to try not to layer too many different types of um, sort of mission orientation. We too had historic funding, we had federal funding, we also had some clean energy funding. Um, we had our own mission for what we wanted to do with the building. And it was a lot of mission goals kind of all in the same building. I think we did end up managing it uh, satisfactorily, but that's that you can sometimes layer too many challenges onto your project. And if you eliminated one, you might have um, greater success. Thanks, Laurel. And Patrick. Thanks. I mean, I'm last. I, they've already said all the good things. Um, and I would, you know, echo everything. But, you know, the idea that the project you're doing now is replicatable and can help you into the next project, I think is great. Think about the relationships you're building now. But I guess one thing I would say is our project was also very staff driven. That was me. Um, and I think if I was to give advice, I'd say, don't be afraid of trying to build money into your budget to hire someone to help with all this stuff. I think you're hearing how complicated these projects can get, and it is easy to get in over your head with the requirements. And if you're able to build it in on the front end to hire someone who can do some of that heavy lifting, it'll give you more time to tell your story and help raise the money. Um, and I, you'll certainly have, I think, an easier time and a better project overall. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you to all the panelists. Um, so if you all have questions, there is down at the bottom of your Zoom screen a reaction button. If you click on that, there's a little raise hand function and you'll bump up to the top of our screen so you can see you and I'll just show what it looks like. Um, and then you lower it when you're done or you can type them into the chat box. Um, I'll give you all just a few seconds to navigate that button. And if not, I have a few kind of follow-up questions for the panelists. Um, some things that we didn't quite have time to cover. Um, yes, Egan. Hi, this is John Egan. Um, we have two guys named John here, so that's why my last name shows up on the screen. Um, in, in Maine, we have the advantage of a uh, state historic uh, rehab tax credit, um, which pairs nicely with the federal historic tax credit. And I know a couple of comments were made about there could be a whole two hour session on just doing the financing for historic deals. But um, specifically to Patrick, was there um, uh, was there consideration for using the uh, state tax credit? And only because I know right across the street from the Center Theater is the Mayo Mill, which I was involved with financing about um, uh, 10 years ago. Um, and so I just wanted to know if, if that was under consideration for the center theater? Uh, it wasn't for this project. It's actually an interesting story how one project can lead to another. Um, the theater itself, unfortunately, because of all the work that's been done to it over the years, wasn't able to qualify on the national register. Okay. But we would, we would qualify as part of a historic district. So we did go get a grant and now there is a national historic commercial district here in downtown Dover Foxcroft that the theater is a member of, yay. Great, so you're um, a contributing member of the district. Okay, that's yeah. just as good as being on the register. Well, exactly. So I think going forward, it's certainly a possibility, but it wasn't something that we were able to do for this project in particular. Great, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I do have a question and I think Laurel and Isaac, you can speak to this based on my conversations with you. Um, building capacity with local contractors. I know one of the challenges with federal requirements is procurement and sometimes procurement doesn't always gel well with rural locations and finding large enough firms to bid on, on contracts. How did you build capacity within local firms to, to meet the needs of your project? Who's first, Laurel or me? <laughs> you can go ahead, Isaac. A couple minutes. Right. Yeah. Um, we uh, it's that's actually a, a, an interesting story in our case. Um, um, we've done it um, by accident. Um, we did a full 
uh, procurement process with a construction manager um, back in June on this uh, project and um, on the Bridgewater project. And basically we didn't get bids in a lot of divisions or the divisions we did get bids in were very high. Uh, and ultimately we ended up rejecting um, rejecting that estimate or that uh, in, 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 the, in the language that we use that uh, uh, guaranteed maximum price that that contractor would have offered us. And we have taken on um, uh, basically uh, um, self GCing, uh, self general contracting. We have a few board members who are general contractors and I have a fair amount of experience in that realm. So we're, we're self general contracting at, at this point. Um, and so what, what, what that has turned out to be is that we've satisfied all the federal and state procurement requirements because we made the best effort possible. We've, we, we begged and pleaded for bidders and we have a list and um, that's given us some latitude to hire local, just go directly to people now and say, please bid on this. So for instance, the guy across the street who is a painter, but not like a painter that has a website or a big set of trucks uh, you know he's just a you know your average guy painter he's going to be our painter and you know we've had to help him a little bit with like the davis bacon paperwork but um other than that um he's going to be our painter now uh, our local electrician he's going to be our electrician now so um so that's our funny story and if we have this session again next year i'll let you know how it all turned out because uh it's a big experiment at this point <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I look forward to it. Um, Laurel, you, I know you have a, a story with Lancaster as well. Yeah, sure. We, um, again, we, we have, our organization has a fair amount of experience with federal funds. Um, not, not so much, um, this was our first time using federal funds for a construction project, but we certainly were well aware of a lot of um, procurement uh, requirements. We have already had in place some, some policies and procedures, so that helped us a lot that kind of at the front end before we even knew we would be using any poten potential federal funds, um, we utilized our own internal procurement process to select a construction management company. Um, and we did receive bids from, I think four or five different uh, organizations um, and then ended up kind of late to the games, uh, getting a bid from a local contractor, Garland Mill. Um, and this for them was a capacity building project as they had a lot of um, construction experience and, and but more in the design build area and not so much in construction management. And uh, we had an owner's rep at the time, Michael Bruss, who had tons of experience with historical work, but with also um, construction management and project management. And he ended up um, working with them to kind of uh, help them build the capacity they needed in order to deliver this project. And because we were using such a well-known local firm, they had a lot of connections with local contractors to do some of the subcontracting. Um, and I'm not gonna say it was all super smooth and easy. Um, and COVID definitely created a lot of wrinkles in contractor availability and timing and material costs. And just, it just got super complicated, but, um, I think building that local support was was key and it was part of what we wanted to do. We wanted to try and keep as many of the sort of project dollars in that North Country area. Um, again, it did require a fair amount of um, extra work and handholding by various members of our team, um, but I think it was well worth it. Um, so we'll just end on a, a few words of encouragement from our panelists for groups that are just starting out with these projects or maybe have gotten stuck along the way um, and would encourage any of the attendees to, to reach out to the staff at the statewide if you have any questions. Uh, we'll put our contact information up when we wrap up and we'll send it out in an email as well. So um, Patrick, a few words for those getting started. A lot of work, but it's so worth it. Um, the center theater itself wouldn't be here right now, except that unfortunately, the town of Dover lost a historic hotel, oh gosh, 25 years ago. And it, it lit a fire in the community to preserve historic buildings. Now we're here, we're looking at maybe there's another building in town we want to work with too, but it's great work. And the more, the more of the work you do, the more support you get for the future. So 
it's not going to be easy, but it's worth it. Laurel. Well, I um, I just want to compliment all of you guys on in, in the various state preservation alliance uh, organizations because there's a tremendous amount of knowledge and expertise that you have and not just about doing historic work, but about utilizing these grant funds. Um, so I think my word of encouragement for anybody with a new project would be to reach out and, and get some free advice from, from your statewide organization um, or, or reach out to, and I'm, I'm always happy to talk about my project and things that work for, for me. I think talking to people that have been in the space before and getting some pointers to you know, keep you on the right path um, should be all the encouragement you need. Isaac? Hi, my, uh, my parting words of encouragement are just a short story that I probably should have answered earlier and put a more positive spin on the fundraising, what works for fundraising. I guess my word of encouragement is don't underestimate what you can uh, fundraise from local individuals. Um, in Bridgewater, one of our board members there is a, uh, he's a furniture, high-end furniture maker. Um, his strategy was to go through the list of people that he had sold a thousand dollar, multi-thousand dollar bed frames or, or dresser drawers to in the past decade. And he literally went up and down the streets knocking on people's doors because when you custom design furniture for them, you get to know them pretty well. He raised a quarter million dollars in, in, a, in, a, in a few months by knocking on people's doors talking about the community center and talking about the impact of it and saying, listen, if you can spend 10 or $11,000 on a bed frame, you can spend $200 on a contribution to this project and people did it. And, and I, I don't think the size of your community is a barrier to that. I think you can make the ask if you've got a compelling project and people will donate to it. Thanks Isaac. And Andy, we'll have you close us out. <laughs> well, I, I, after so many great comments, I really don't have anything additional to, to add to them, I, I, except that I, I do think to, you know, to, 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 to just to think about the importance of the kind of projects that we've been discussing this morning for the communities in which they're situated and, 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 and the sort of resources in terms of, in terms of volunteers, in terms of funding, in terms of individual financial contributions in terms of the morale of communities and how they view how they view themselves and what's possible and to to really have confidence that that it might not all come I mean I think the points many of you uh, that uh, that Isaac made in particular you know you don't you, you, you that it's not all like going to be the master plan and it just proceeds smoothly from A to Z that's not that's that's customarily not how they're not commercial these are not commercial projects in, in, in many in many in many ways um, they have their own they have their own rhythms their own laws of mo motion in that sense and just to be confident that however the thing pans out um, you're going to have more at the end of it than you had at the beginning of it um, both in physical terms and in terms of community engagement and community and community right that sounds like an excellent place to leave it so a huge thank you to Laurel and Isaac, Patrick and Andy and to your organizations for participating in today's session and for, you know, working with us on these projects. It's been really exciting to see them happen over the past few years. If any of you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Our contact info is on the screen and we'll send it in a follow up email. And I look forward to continuing to work with you all and to being in touch in the future. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day.